High above the mountains of northeastern Afghanistan, F-16 fighter jets take turns to refuel. Second eyes on him. He's a stir. How do that? Sears look good, nice and stable. We're a little slow and it doesn't seem to be an issue. Minutes later. All right, disconnect. They're ready to get back into the fight, providing air cover for Afghan forces battling insurgent fighters. 17 years in, and America's longest war shows no sign of ending. When Donald Trump became president, it looked like he might pull the troops out of Afghanistan once and for all. But instead, in August, he upped the ante, increasing troop numbers and promising that America will stay until, in his words, the war is won. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please be seated. The men and women who serve our nation in combat deserve a plan for victory. They deserve the tools they need and the trust they have earned to fight and to win. Afghan commandos launch a night raid on a Taliban position. Despite improvements in elite troops like these, the fact is that Afghanistan still looks like a quagmire. The latest figures show that last year the Taliban expanded their territory. Meanwhile, opium production is at record levels, and in January, insurgents launched a series of horrific terrorist attacks in Kabul and elsewhere around the country. General John Nicholson is one of the longest serving officers in Afghanistan. He's in his third year as the commander of US and NATO forces, and is reckoned to have played a pivotal role in formulating America's new policy. So this, uh, of course, is America's longest war. It's one that started uh, because of 9-11 and the attacks on our country, which emanated from here. Uh, my office was in the Pentagon and struck by the plane that hit the Pentagon on 9-11. So for, for me and many of us, it's, it's personal. Now, it wasn't clear that President Trump was going to commit America to this conflict, you advocated quite hard that America should continue. Why did you argue? Well, the, the military chain of command is one voice in our policy process, just as in any country. And the military assessment was that because of the number of terrorist groups in the region, but there's a total of 21 such groups in the region, violent extremist organizations, terrorist organizations, et cetera, the highest concentration anywhere in the world. Uh, so, so this threat, if, if we don't keep pressure on this threat, the risk is, that will suffer more attacks on our homeland from the region. So we believe, from a military perspective, that remaining here, uh, and albeit in a much uh, smaller form than we once were, enables us to maintain adequate pressure on these groups and protect our homelands. Back at the peak of the war, you know, 2013, 2014, there were up to 130,000 troops here. Now you've got, what, it's going to be about 16,000 troops. How can you possibly expect to make a difference with such a tiny number of troops compared to the peak? Well, the difference is today we have 320,000 Afghans under uniform. So when we came here and we surged to 150,000 troops, this was only for a period of about 18 months. And it was during that period that we began to grow the Afghan army to its present size. As soon as we grew this army uh, to a size approaching us, we drew down our troops sharply. Now. At that point, I'd say we drew down too fast and too far. And what we've, the exercise we've gone through here recently is right-sizing that force so we can provide the appropriate amount of advising, training, and assisting to the Afghans so that they can own the fight. They are the ones taking the fight to the enemy. They do need our help, yes, and they do need our financial support, but they are the ones who are fighting and dying for their country, and by doing that, they're protecting us. But hold on, you've been supporting them now for almost 17 years. What are you going to do now that's going to make a difference. What we talked about was, number one, the end state is reconciliation. This is what the Afghans want. And that in order to do that, there needed to be more military pressure applied to the enemy. In order to do that, there needed to be significant improvements in the Afghan military. The investment in the Afghan army is already well underway. One of America's top special forces officers shows me the huge training compound for commandos on the outskirts of Kabul. The plan is to double the number of these elite troops to 24,000 in total. They call these guys the tip of the spear. It's their job 
to take the fight to the Taliban. Commandos like these and special forces make up just 10% of Afghan troops, but they carry out 80% of offensive operations. The plans for the Afghan Air Force are even more ambitious. The aim is it will triple in size. Afghan aircraft are already starting to take over from the U.S., targeting Taliban positions and providing air support for operations by Afghan troops. Why the Army and the Air Force? What can they bring to the fight? They bring offensive capability. So offensive capability is what's needed to break the stalemate that existed before this time. And this enables them to then move into those areas where or that have either been contested or that 12% uh, of the area that's been controlled by the Taliban and take those areas back under control of the government. Offensive capability. The combat here in Afghanistan sits in a regional context, doesn't it? And 150 years ago, when Britain was fighting wars here in Afghanistan, they called this the great game. And that great game continues to play out in the, with new players, if you like. So for example, one of the big issues brought by your president, President Trump, is the role of Pakistan here. Now, President Trump was absolutely clear that as far as he's concerned, Pakistan has been harboring and facilitating the Taliban. Now, that is a huge problem, isn't it? Yes, it is. So external enablement is the only way that this insurgency continues. Without external enablement, it would never survive inside the country. What do you mean? So I mean, they have bases, training facilities. They recruit outside of the country. They have madrasas outside of the country. Their leadership lives in safety outside of Afghanistan. Where outside of Afghanistan? Well, I mean, and, and in many places, but you, you mentioned Pakistan. And so again, this, is, uh, this has been stated clearly by President Trump in his August speech. So crucially, President Trump cut military support for, for Pakistan and said, if you continue this policy, then we will continue the pressure against you. As the commander of forces here, are you beginning to see a difference? Is that beginning to change? I think, I think the biggest difference is now we have a public conversation about peace. So I think uh, while it, it may be hard to draw a direct linkage uh, between the statements by President Trump and the Taliban uh, uh, willingness to talk about peace, I believe there is a linkage. So this is a, the, the pressure for reconciliation is multifaceted. It's military, yes, but it's also diplomatic, it's social. So all these forms of pressure are what result in a conversation about peace. But is Pakistan still harboring Taliban leaders, is it? We, we believe they're still, uh, uh, our, the enemies we're fighting, we believe are still uh, living on the other side of the border. And so uh, they have pushed many of them into Afghanistan, and we want to give them credit for that. And through, through operations they've done in Waziristan, Zarbiarb, and other operations, and operations along the border, they're attempting to interdict these uh, terrorists and uh, stop the flow back and forth. Now, the other external act talked about a little bit less is Russia. We're told by senior, senior police officers, by senior military figures within Afghanistan, that Russia is providing weapons and other resources for the Taliban. We share some interests with Russia in Afghanistan, and clearly they're acting to undermine our interests as well. And we are here, in our, especially in our U.S. role, to go after those terrorists who could potentially uh, pose a threat to any, any country around the world. So, so there's a counterterrorism objective that we share. There's a counter-narcotics objectives that we share. There's a, an interest in peace and reconciliation. So we would hope that the Russians would see this opportunity uh, to work in support of common interests as the way forward. However, that's not been the case. So what's been happening? Well, what we have seen is destabilizing activity by the Russians. We see a, a narrative that's being used that grossly exaggerates the number of ISIS fighters here. This narrative then is used as a justification for the Russians to legitimize the actions of the Taliban and provide some degree of support uh, to the Taliban. What support do you understand? Well, it, th this support, frankly, it's, it's difficult to quantify. I mean, but it does amount. We've had stories written by the Taliban that have appeared in the media about financial support provided by the enemy. We've had weapons brought to this headquarters and given to us by Afghan leaders and said this was given by the Russians to the Taliban. We know that the Russians are involved. Uh, again, I mentioned the misinformation campaign, which will be familiar to anyone who's observed the Russian behavior elsewhere around the world. We also see a series of exercises being conducted on the border with Afghanistan. This is in Tajikistan. Tajikistan. Yes, and so these are counterterrorism exercises, but as we've seen the Russian pattern before, they bring in large amounts of equipment, then they leave some of it behind. The point is the Russians use the pretext of a spillover 
of terrorism from Afghanistan as the reason to support the Taliban, which of course is destabilizing to the country and destabilizing to the efforts of the United States and NATO. This, this activity has picked up uh, in, kind of in parallel with the war in Syria of, of interest. So you think this is in a way a kind of proxy war, that they're keeping pressure on America through um, the activities of the Taliban in Afghanistan? Th this activity really picked up in the last 18 to 24 months. And so prior to that, uh, we had not seen this kind of uh, destabilizing activity by Russia here. And, and when you look at the timing, it, it roughly correlates to when things started to heat up in Syria. So it's interesting to note um, the timing of the whole. This is what is funding Afghanistan's seemingly interminable conflict. Opium and the heroin it is used to produce. Some 90% of the world's supply of heroin now comes from Afghanistan. And production has been going through the roof. It almost doubled last year according to UN figures. The Taliban and other insurgent groups tax production and use the revenue that raises to fund their operations. Now, narcotics is a hugely important issue here because, of course, this is a key revenue source for the Taliban. As the Taliban raise money, they become effectively a kind of cartel. It's what you saw, very similar kind of behavior in Colombia. Um, and the danger is that that creates momentum for, the, for this insurgency to continue. Are you worried about the role of uh, narcotics, of, of opium in this conflict? Absolutely, Justin. I mean, the, the dynamic you outlined is exactly what we're concerned about, that despite their original uh, religious roots, that this organization is morphing into a narco-insurgency uh, that, that now is a money-making enterprise and making lots of money in areas. So, so there's an interest in maintaining instability. There's an interest in uh, keeping the government out in order to profit from the drugs trade. And then these drugs, of course, find their way around the world. So yes, we are concerned about that, that uh, that this behavior uh, is, is now more about making money and sustaining the insurgency for the purpose of profit than it is about their uh, original religious and political uh, leanings. Okay, and so how has that changed your tactics? Yeah, what it does is we have to go after the sources of Taliban revenue. So the authorities granted to me under the U.S. South Asia policy, new authorities granted by President Trump enable us to target sources of Taliban revenue. Narcotics is the number one source, as you pointed out. So we're now actively going after those sources. Now, 90% of the opium in this country and the heroin is produced uh, in the areas that are under Taliban influence or control or contested. So we see a clear convergence between the criminal behavior and the areas of the insurgency. And you don't see that in the areas under government control, which is about two thirds of the Talking on the subject of the areas of control, figures produced by an organization called SEGA, an American agency, suggest the Taliban is expanding its area of inf in influence, or at least it did last year. Now does that, that must be dispiriting as the commander of forces to see the Taliban effectively advancing. Yeah, those uh, numbers came from us. And we disagree. The uh, the way uh, the way they interpreted the yes figures. the way the way they were interpreted. Number one, uh, we look at population control, and they, and the government controls 64 to 65 percent of the population. The figure they have chosen to use instead of population control is is the is the figure of actual area. space on the ground, area on the ground. So the are you uh, saying that's not a legitimate way to describe the you know the territory controlled by the Taliban? We, we we think that the the population is much more relevant than the empty desert, uh, for example. But regardless, the offensive capability of the Afghans is going to expand that control to drive the enemy to more remote areas of the country, even more remote than they already are, in order to eventually uh, force them to either reconcile or live in irrelevance. Now, this, we're in the 17th year of the war, and you sound very confident that the, you know, the capability of the Afghan army are going to increase really significantly. I mean, you haven't 17 years taught you that this effectively, use the word yourself, we're in a stalemate here, aren't we? Yeah, well, no, I, well, that, that stalemate is done with the South you, Asia We've policy. moved on from that. Yes. And, uh, it, You've that, broken it. That was the case when I, when I was here uh, two years ago, when I first took command. But it's no longer the case uh, with the U.S.-South Asia policy and the momentum that we're gaining with that. And this is because this army, this Afghan army, is getting better, is, does, is proving itself on the battlefield. The Air Force is growing in capability. The Air Force last year ran almost 
twice as many strikes, the Afghan Air Force, as the U.S. Air Force. So that, that was never a factor uh, previously. The commandos that you visited, uh, these commandos um, were are doubling in size. So with, with 30 companies of commandos, they, uh, they control two-thirds of the population. With, with twice that many, they're going to be able to expand into these new areas. Well, hold on. We can see that the Taliban can project force right into the heart of Kabul, Kabul because it did so, didn't it, with these awful bombs that were uh, and other attacks in uh, late December and January. We saw terrible attacks here in Kabul. I mean, what does that tell us about the state of the war? Well, of course, the suicide bombers uh, are on a one-way trip. You know, they, they just have to make it in. They, they only have to, have to be good once to get in. Uh, these, are, these are horrendous attacks, and the death of any civilian is something that we want to avoid. So this is exposing the hypocrisy of the Taliban. I mean, if, they're, if they theoretically are here for the good of the Afghan people to replace a government, um, then why are they killing the citizens that they've said in their annual statements they're trying to protect? So you're saying these bombs in Kabul and elsewhere in the country, these are a measure of success. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm not. I'm saying it shows a lowering of ambition. They, in 2016, for example, they tried eight times to take cities, uh, and each time they were defeated with heavy losses. In 2017, they then focused more on districts, and this is where you saw uh, modest gains at some time, and then the Afghans would come in and retake the district. And again, we ended up at about the same place. In September of 2017, following the announcement by President Trump of the South Asia policy, the Taliban leadership held a meeting in Quetta, and they discussed their strategy going forward. They made a deliberate decision to no longer try to seize cities or districts, but rather to resort to suicide attacks as a way to maintain their relevance and to show that they were still present. So this is a lowering of ambition from seizing terrain and controlling population to, to conducting terrorist attacks. And as the commander of forces here, how do you interpret that? Well, we have to adjust to that to protect the population. I view it as a lowering of ambition, which means that our pressure is working. There, there are casualties that they suffer from trying to seize cities and carve out a space of Afghanistan that they can call their own is not working. And uh, they, we, what we anticipate this year is more suicide attacks and an assassination campaign to go after specific leaders. So again, when you look at the spectrum from you know, conventional war to terrorism, they're moving down the spectrum closer to terrorism uh, as an organization. Now, in the weeks after those horrific attacks, President Ghani made a peace offer to the Taliban, a very generous peace offer. He said, you know, we'll, uh, we, we, you know, we won't pursue criminal actions against you. We'll free leaders from prison. We'll, get, we'll lift sanctions against you. We'll give you freedom of movement in the country. We'll let you set up a, a party. Taliban at the Soli. It is the most comprehensive peace offer to the Taliban since the Afghan war started in 2001. But President Ghani's government is deeply divided on this, as it is on most other issues. The Taliban isn't a coherent organization either. Its divisions have made it a tough enemy to fight, and it will also hamper any peace negotiations. Even if some Taliban do wish to make peace, there are likely to be others that are minded to resist any agreement with the Afghan government. This is an enemy that you've been fighting for 16 years. I mean, were you, were you surprised how generous President Ghani's offer was? Did you support the offer? We support the offer. We want to see a peaceful reconciliation in Afghanistan. What, what you don't see uh, necessarily in the public domain is all of the back-channel communication that's going on. Many in the Taliban are tired of this war. There are many Taliban who, who, uh, who disagree with these tactics. They fundamentally disagree with attacks on universities, with blowing up civilians, with killing, with blowing up a hospital. I mean, they disagree with this approach. And what we see are fissures emerging inside the Taliban leadership. And this outreach that's occurring uh, on, on multiple levels uh, is, is what President Ghani was, was addressing here. Because we think there are many of the Taliban just like there are many uh, Afghans here that want to lay down their arms and see peace and stability return to the country. So why haven't we had a response from the Taliban? I don't know. You have to ask the Taliban. I mean, this is, they, they, he, he put a generous offer out there. They wrote an open letter to the people of America. Uh, this needs to be an Afghan-led process. This needs to be a process between Afghans. And so we're hopeful that the Taliban will respond to this and will uh, we'll engage in a, in a peaceful reconciliation. 
Now, President Trump's policy is conditions-based. That means until the success here. How long do you think this will last? I'm encouraged that six months after President Trump announced the policy, we have peace offers being discussed by both the government and the Taliban. I don't think this is any uh, coincidence. It's the pressure that this represents. And what this represents, when we say it's a conditions-based policy, this is a fundamental change from the past, and it's an important point here. It demonstrates that we have the will, and war is a contest of wills, and that we have now demonstrated the will to see this through. And I think that demonstration of will has contributed to getting these two parties to the point where they're both talking about peace in their own way. When President Trump spoke about his commitment to Afghanistan, he talked about winning here. He talked about victory. What would victory in Afghanistan look like? Winning is a reconciliation amongst the warring parties where they lay down their arms and bring stability to Afghanistan. That stability would then enable pressure to be kept on the terrorist groups so that no terrorist attacks emanate from this region. But we know from working alongside these brave Afghan soldiers for all these years that they are ready to keep pressure on those terrorists. But it is a reconciliation that, that brings us to that point. So victory could mean a government including the Taliban? This has to be an Afghan solution. We in the international community are here to help the Afghans and to prevent terrorist attacks emanating from the region. And so, so uh, yes, whatever, whatever path the Afghans take. Now, President Ghani laid out some of, the, some of the conditions, respect for the Constitution, for human rights, for women's rights in particular, uh, a renouncement of violence and, and uh, terrorism. And so, so the, these, these um, elements have, have been laid on the table, not as preconditions, but as things that they'd be looking for. In a... But the Taliban haven't got back. They haven't answered President Ghani. What would your message be to the Taliban? I hope that they take advantage of this opportunity to bring this this uh, war to a conclusion. And they've been offered very generous uh, uh, terms as a start point. And what happens if they don't? What well, happens if they we, don't? We, we will maintain our pressure on the enemy. We're gonna maintain military pressure, we're gonna maintain diplomatic pressure, and they're gonna experience social pressure, continued rejection by the Afghan people. How optimistic are you almost 17 years into this conflict? that there can be a kind of resolution, a reconciliation here. I think we, have, we are at a moment now with, the, with these offers on the table. Again, uh, much work to be done, but we're at a moment now that we've not been at before, uh, where, these, where this discussion of peace and offer by the government, a consideration going on by the Taliban, their own form of an offer to the American people, uh, it's a moment we haven't been at before. And so I am hopeful that this moment will deliver the peace that all the Afghans deserve that we want, uh, which will enable us to protect our homelands uh, in, in a more secure way uh, and, and eventually um, leave, leave this to the Afghans to, to live in stability and peace.